So a quick run through of this uh, cybernetics invention and production lecture. This fellow's name is Cornelius Treble. He invented the first oven that had a elemental self-regulating uh, principle in it. Uh, well, he's from the 16th century. I think uh, Huron did stuff like this uh, back in like 500 BC or something with the uh, invention of the precursor to the engine. It's like an astrolabe that rolls in a circle. But uh, this guy believed in the sky and the clouds and the water and, uh, you know, like good uh, vitalist forefather, forefounder of chemistry. He uh, set up vacuums and condensations. But his oven uh, was was pretty cool. Uh, it made its way only into maybe a folk distribution. It never really made it itself into a uh, uh, industrial workhorse uh, production line unit until after his death. Uh, but just the principle that there's this revolving inner inner uh, conclusion, self self regulation. Uh, it's somewhat uh, related to recursion, the programming principle that you return your output back into your input to feed your second output. This little bottle right here is an early max abstraction I called ladder E and you just input how many times you want it to recurse and you input the uh, list that you want it to kind of grind off of so every time it goes through it'll grind that off so if you put in a negative one negative one positive one positive one then every time a square goes through it it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and in real time you can change what's going up or what's going down But the Uzi uh, is a, a very fast tool that just spits out that many actions before you can blink. Here's some others. Uh, one time when I had case sensitivity on my computer, I had to recreate the LAD object. So here it is, uh, legally capable of doing uh, up to seven operations in the replacement for the buffer. And actually I just used an L sub <laughs> and multiply it and, and L molted the list to create addition again. This one here is Vizzy. All it does is that you send it in a uh, XY XY and then it'll just uh, turn that into a parsed actually you, you know you just send it in one XY and it creates the second XY and does some offsetting so that uh, one goes to the upper left, one goes to the lower right based on the uh, offset on second input and then maybe the third input's color control. Uh, plus pair. So just a quick utility that adds two pairs together I guess. And then uh, this is a self-created L wave, which is uh, takes the averages of two lists. And I made it by putting an L sum together with an L length, so it finds the average of a one list from all of its uh, inputs. So this isn't a max patch. This is a mechanical structure. This is the Watts engine governor. From 1788. Looks like a max patch though. Here's the patch cord that uh, through linkages controls the flu of a fire. Uh, and these two weighted balls, uh, when they go through some centripetal force, they get up here. And that makes this lever tilt down, this lever tilt up, 
this flue open. So the faster it goes, the less air or more air it gets. Mechanisms these days uh, with circuit board design, with screen printing design, with multi-layer printing have uh, evolved into things that can be smaller than a piece of money. You can layer plastics in between carbons so that you can get soft little uh, bendable areas. And then, in theory, maybe these lock so that it can't bend farther than too far. The guy invented a, a printing technology that had the ability to uh, self-assemble or at least uh, make assembly super intuitive so that nothing but assembly could happen once it fidgeted around. Yep, so here's the assembly board of this skin particular character. I don't know if it flies, but it has a piezoelectric battery input. Put positive on top, negative on the bottom. And there's the solenoid or a little wiggle mechanism that makes these guys go ultra fast. And it's created on this assembly plate. It's printed with this plate, and the plate is required to be able to hold these structures and help assemble them in in tandem. There is a special word for that type of scaffolding which referred to its ability to stabilize it. Only what is asked of the grasshopper will happen because of the scaffolding. carbon. So here's uh, Aristotle. He posited a being at the beginning of the universe called the Unmoved Mover. This character had the uh, ability to be outside of the universe and somehow be a, a causal origin of the causal links that we are kind of acknowledging sort of embodied all the different planets in a way to being unmoved movers kind of like he uh, showed up on the scene and saw what was already there already in the sky and thought about the limits of uh, control or portability or forklifts and said well these guys uh, weren't put there by anything nothing could have put those there and ideas like his were very well uh, depicted in this medieval time etching of a fellow reaching outside of the cosmic sphere, accessing uh, otherworldly content somehow. Limits of one universe. Plato talked about Socrates uh, hanging out with Parmenides, and Parmenides. Uh, put down some mad wisdom on Socrates on his way into getting his uh, jury summons for his death sentence. Third anime man argument was a concept that uh, the title of a group could be put in a group with the stuff in the group to create a meta group such that infinite meta groups recurse backwards. Can't really get to the beginning of anything because you just keep putting that meta husk in another husk. No wonder Dostoevsky liked talking about onions so much. And Plato also had this concept that there's a perfection outside of the universe. Everything that we have is uh, a little fractal a little weathered and beyond and above and before perhaps the uh, fracture there is uh, an original mathematical kind of 
abstraction that is better than the world, outside of the world. Norbert Weiner helped invent the automatic death machine. He optimized uh, anti-aircraft guns to be able to condition themselves versus, uh, you know, conditions. Cold, hot, wet, dry. So the machines could start thinking for themselves, do uh, more of their own automation, leave less to the service provider. More cigarettes, perhaps. More abstraction. He was into this stuff called Brownian motion. Supposedly, we've always known about these uh, minute particles that have a little random warble to them in a well-lit dark room. You know, just a beam of light rolling through. You get the contrast enough to be able to see the little invisible particles of dust. And uh, back in ancient Greek times, people like Democritus were putting down concepts like the atom for the first time. We're sort of based on this stuff. There is an Anax Manor character who believed in a Perion, some kind of like fifth element stuff, and he believed the origin of the universe was wrapped well around this uh, abstraction of polarity or chemistry. Heraclitus thought it was fire. Thales thought it was water. And then Democritus says it's just particle itself. And X Manor says it's just kind of a theory all itself. But how far can we uh, loop ourselves? I mean, if you recursed out into feedback, being feed fed back to fed back, you start generating neural nets, generating sentience circulation. The first automation of uh, illusion might be the Turk. Inside this little zone was a, a little boy who could play some really good chess. And all he had to do was move hands up and down, twirl, 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 twist, 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 that, that, that. I don't know how they kept it so quiet for him in there. You'd think a little boy would be muffling and ruffling and have to cough every once in a while. But somehow the Turk uh, traveled the world and beat some people at chess. He was pretty good. Imagine not only teaching a little kid how to play chess, but telling him to hide behind the guise of a mechanical man. When Napoleon encountered this guy, he tried to corrupt it, tried to break it. He did illegal moves to see what this automaton would do. The automaton uh, knocked the stuff off the table a couple times, and then after like the fourth uh, violative move, the Turk just said, fuck this game. Knocked everything off the table. But up here I uh, mentioned uh, dividing by zero, short, short circuits. Uh, permeable membranes, self-attenuation. The new way Mechanical Turk is doing its thing is with artificial, artificial intelligence. You can make about mm, 20, 40 cents an hour at least. Sitting there and uh, filling out surveys for the world at large. This one's from a spin-off website called The Social Turk. So it's not exactly a business card sorting like most of the stuff is on the strict mechanical world. But it's more of a kind of like a Facebook meets automation of uh, interaction. Yeah. Strange. Outsourcing, uh, what is it, social development, emotional uh, decision making. Well, for John Searle, another philosopher, he believed in uh, 
The machine's not really ever getting to that point where they knew much. He created the concept of the Chinese room, which is just thought experiment where you offer a piece of paper with Chinese on it to a box. It feeds it in mechanically. Someone in the box doesn't know Chinese but has a bunch of thesauruses and lexicons so that they can interpret Chinese into their native language and then do some decision making based on their own brain, sort of. You know, the question comes in, you give an answer to it, and then you write it down uh, back in Chinese on a piece of paper and then uh, punch it out the output of your function black box. And then, for all they know, you know Chinese and give them a Chinese answer so that you're on the same level as them. But uh, John Searle said there's some kind of a disparity between the native language used. If you interpret into another one, you're sort of not living the life of the Chinese knowledge. So he extrapolated beyond that thought experiment to saying that a computer is pretty much the same Chinese room. It has to do some procedural structural damage uh, distilling of whatever theoretical or emotional sensation you offer it. And all it knows is the ones and the zeros. But it can help you out with your meta level of uh, understanding. But that help is kind of a dry procedural, no matter how lively Syria tries to get. So a hollow shell is all a computer might ever be, and all we ourselves might ever be if you micro-define our inner languages such that any incompatibilities or, or translations between uh, language worlds might deviate from an all-encompassing expression or coherence interaction. So, um, a couple psychology references I was trying to deduce about conflicts or a lot of these are uh, kind of logical, logical errors on a social productive level. Say, double blind, double blind is a Gregory Bateson concept, I think, uh, I think it's Greg, about uh, you getting two conflicting messages and you gotta act on something. So a lot of times, sort of like the Chinese room, too many messages, just uh, blithering tickets going out the outputs rather than anything decisive. And uh, Jeff Goldblum put it best in Jurassic Park when he said something about how uh, Anthropologists can't study nothing without damaging their uh, specimen. Go to Africa, look at some natives, and then go back to England and say, you experienced the jungle. So uh, it exists in physics, such as the Heisenberg effect. Things. Uh, get less and less coherent the more you try to pin down their coherence with uh, motion or direction or position. The more you know, the harder it is to know more. I'm um, pretty sure origins of existentialism are revolving a bit about, around that concept. That there's a, a break or a limit to perception that we might be butting our heads against. In electronics, you put your uh, testing clips on the circuit, and the circuit changes. It's the diagnostics of a living system. I think Kierkegaard might have said something about that. You have to kind of kill the system for any analytical cadaver autopsy to be accomplished. Don't really know what's going on in life itself. 
And then, uh, of course, uh, as rational as science tries to be, it is biased. It is uh, trying to find the answer it's looking for. Just ask Amgen or uh, Siemens or Lockheed Martin about what, what they're trying to make science accomplish. And they will probably say that they are working on metallurgy and approaching materials to sound and pressure barriers and uh, creating more condensed explosions, more contained physical uh, powers. So they created a, a scientific testing methodology called the double blind, where you don't let the scientists really know who's who to root for in the, the game of the experiment, who's got which drugs digested. The scientist doesn't know. They'll find out after they report all their findings unbiasedly. So it's a, it's a strange way to detach yourself from what you believe in, to hope that what you believe in is still real. So they don't know who the control group is. In uh, early, early productivity studies, probably later on than the origin of productivity studies with Taylorism and my, my personal friend, the guy that made the thib Thiblings, th Thirbrulings, Gil Gilbreth, motion studies with light. Uh, the Hawthorne effect was a, a less psychedelic experiment just to find out people that were, uh, say, working, creating little brackets if uh, if they controlled their their state you know if they got to choose what they were going to accomplish did they accomplish more so they just made an experiment and they had some good findings but then they realized that there's another finding that if you're looking for findings then the workers are kind of tipped off and they're going to work a little better productivity is going to go up if there's novelty and then as soon as the novelty is over then uh, things are just going to idle back down. So it's just similar to the placebo effect. You have the novelty of consuming a tasty little snacky sugar pill and you feel like optimistically you're going to get better. Scientology uh, said 95% of illnesses are psychosomatic. Wouldn't that be a lucky uh, case for Jim Henson's longevity? Because Christian scientists don't, don't take drugs. They use prayer. Imagine praying away uh, something that was like Ebola. So uh, this leads into biocomputing a little bit. Here's Ebola for you. This is actually just a... What kind of mold? Yellow mold? It has the ability to do certain computer experiments, uh, procedural, instructional uh, pathfinding. That's what mold does. It looks for food. So they've been able to put mold in mazes, and it has the ability to suss out where the solution to the maze is, long enough timeline. Maybe it optimizes. Here's a an ex thought experiment run rampant into the world of art and uh, sculpture a little bit because they put little stacks of oats on different places in here in Upper Canada where there is big cities. Then they ran the mold loose and the mold chose pathways between the uh, positions of the oats um, based on a density that resembled the freeway systems that us humans had chosen for the same uh, yeah, abstraction of, of topology, topography. So this is the traveling sales experiment. Mold can find out what's the best route between different locations. It's a permutational, permutational equation and uh, you could try to do it with brute force technique just run all the equations. That's what they do at DNA. They uh, have 
the ability to just set up different DNA to use RNA as transistors and then they can run every single permutation and maybe faster than you'd anticipate. If you have like, I don't know, 10,000 colonies and each one a little petri dish or maybe even a little uh, water molecule in a petri dish. So maybe you could run them you know, for as many molecules as you have in a cup of water, it could be all your programs running in parallel. So each DNA sequence has a different seed and uh, tries to peel out that seed and generate the solution set. Say, you're trying to find the prime number, or all the prime numbers, and then you just uh, generate every single DNA number and then have them all run until they've exhausted their permutational conclusions and then you just check which one's the longest and uh, in a way if you had the ability to choose every single number then uh, the DNA would do all the work but it's hard to imagine us uh, accomplishing an infinite amount of tasks but I like the idea that it's parallel. You can have one computer, say it's $2,000 worth of circuitry that can run, do one thing at a time. Or you have a petri dish, and each one of those little bacteriums is the equivalent of one of those programs that you can double click on. It uh, saves you a lot of clicking. So, uh, Leonard Alderman is a UC professor that's been working with these RNA running computers, and Lately, he's been able to make it solve some pretty complicated problems mathematically. Ones that have a, a answer set that's a little, bit, a little bit bigger than most. Maybe it's not even an exhaustive answer set, and yet you can still pull some conclusions out. So another guy it's fun to bring up, Dr. Deming. He was a productivity grew in Japan after the World War II. He helped put Japan back on the market. He's uh, one of the only revered foreigners out in Japan in a certain way on the uh, frontier of industrial revolution. But uh, his, his philosophy was about improving quality no matter what, increasing productivity no matter what, and then just leaving most everything else behind. Like, you really don't need much customer service if you already listen to all the things your customers can say. And you really don't need a repair center if you've already uh, fixed all the problems in your product. So he believed uh, in slowing down the productivity until they have finally arrived at the perfect solution to creating the, the process of the project, and then uh, go ahead and turn the assembly line back on. And eliminate inspection by embedding quality. Break down barriers between departments. Leadership instead of quotas. Management skills can't be taught in classes. Mistakes are embedded in the system, not the workman's fault. Customer complaints alone ignored the general population. So you really had to listen to a voice that you're not hearing to find out what's working. And he believed uh, things should be semi-automated so that the human touch either had the last say or still imparted some kind of warmth to the cold, infinitely repeated mechanism. And uh, he believed that I don't know, the manager's getting paid a lot of money because the manager's the root of the problem if, if something goes down. And there's some things you can learn from variation. They, uh, just as Gilbreth tried to say, the different motions of, of making, uh, Deming's working with the kind of behaviors of of the being that is productivity, rather than any individual doing a job. So you'd look at the, the output of the assembly line 
and almost do some kind of native tracking to the animal of the assembly line, find out where it's limping, what's what's happened, uh, what are its nuances, and maybe a little bit of dys dyslexic tracking of uh, possibilities, rather than strictly uh, money carrying the weight of uh, efficiency. So here's the conclusion, don't run the company on visible figures alone. It's the invisible that should guide you, something that makes it so that a company doesn't need to really sell out, because there's, uh, you know, Newman's always donating 10% to charity. There's something more than the business that the business is aspiring to never really uh, accomplish. An infinite uh, goal rather than an attainable one. So Zena's paradox has a, a little bit of similarity to Deming's special conditions. So when something comes off the assembly line, it's either controlled or uncontrolled uncontro variation. It could be something that you see often, something that goes wrong habitually, or it could be something that's just a once in a a new while. So you distinguish between a common cause and a special cause. Some of these uh, ancient philosophy paradoxes are somehow associated with this, I feel. So, let's see. So the focus could would be placed on those responsible for doing something about their variation rather than the source of the variation. Well, Zeno's paradox is uh, you get halfway, and then you have to go halfway again, and then you have to go halfway again, and then you have to go halfway again. So you never really get to the finish line. And yet, we walk across the street occasionally, and common sense tells us we've actually made it across. So, uh, manipulation of animals is somehow related to this. It's uh, similar to running programs. Seeing, seeing what we can make the fleas do with our little cracked whips or uh, temperature control. What could the animals do for us? Human animal, biological species, one thing we can use blue crabs to do, other than uh, for bone meal on our fields, is uh, you can bloodlet them for antigens. They found a, a blue material inside of the blood of a certain crab that has the uh, instant ability to react to bacteriums, so they can just check the clotting of the antigen and it will instantaneously clot to try to stop the bacterium from getting deeper into the nervous system of the little crabby. So it, uh, it's like a scar for a different world of bacteria. So uh, pharmaceutical companies just grab these crabs, take out half their blood, and uh, offer it to uh, the world of the medical science. The program is inside of the, the body of these crabs. Uh, B.F. Skinner was a psychologist uh, from like the 30s, and he in developed behavioralism, and Noam Chomsky uh, fucked him up. He came out with some matter theory and was a little bit more publicly social, so that he got remembered for more amazing work. And B.F. Skinner never really fought back, he never really cared about people putting him down his articles, he just was working on his work didn't really care about the social sphere like a good psychologist so you make these automated food delivery uh, boxes that would manipulate animals uh, to the, like the full extent 
of what like Pavlov's dog experiments would be able to accomplish. How far could you micromanage the consciousness of a little animal to regulate uh, conditioning, regulate words, so that you could somehow convince them that there is a causal relationship between them doing an arbitrary task and uh, them getting what they want, food or warmth or water avo avoiding. So he did a lot of work examining superstition, examining uh, kind of like the folklore or uh, the, the bear, the bear running back up of, of consciousness. He found that there is a conditioning that would take over so that if something went sour, say the floor was made wet in a certain area, then even though that never happened again or wasn't likely to happen with much chance anymore, certain animals like reptiles would just completely avoid that area, even if it was, you know, 24 hours a day, it was the happiest little vacation spot if they had a memory that something had gone wrong they wouldn't try again there is a, a parable about how you could just tie a, tie an elephant to a little stick when it's young and it'll fight against that stick and then by the time it's old it will just accept that that stick is in charge and the elephant could break it at any moment but their behavior has been broken. Uh, he invented a trajectory guidance system for missiles that involved three pigeons that would uh, peck at focused light and uh, triangulate where the rocket should keep on trajectorizing itself with motors or whatnot and they believed that they could just drop this bomb from uh, above the water and the pigeons had been preconditioned to peck at the uh, disturbance on the visual fields that would be a battleship and then you know it's a good idea it sounds like three pigeons could definitely exactly get to that ship it was just a little bit of overhead uh, you know guys in the war don't exactly want to care for birds probably just uh, electromechanical switches and slave slave metal. It's a little easier to, to grimace and wince over than the foul-smelling pigeon poop that's part of your uh, futuristic uh, war machine. Uh, another fellow, I think it was a dentist, came up with this idea that they should put bats in bombs and uh, thought that it was a really great way to attack Japan because of their architecture system and uh, probably it was a good idea I think it might have been delivered like once but didn't really accomplish too much and the bat bomb might have contained like 500 bats inside of it or at least 100 you know they're all really small and they're all in little cartridge containers that will disseminate as soon as the bomb hits the, the air so it just uh, sends out, say, 500 bats, and each one of them has uh, like a one ounce incendiary device on them. So probably will kill each each and every one of those damn bats. But they all roost at night in housing, you know, really weird places where a bat would finally decide to go. And then one ounce incendiary just starts smoldering simultaneously all over Japan at the same time. That's uh, that's chaos for you. That's war. They also tried to do it with anti-tank dogs in Russia when they were fighting against the the Nazis. They would uh, train dogs to enjoy going under tanks for food. They would train dogs to not uh, worry about the large gun explosion noises. And they would try to originally they put the bomb on the back of the dog and send out go go hang out go find a tank to go roost under and then they had a completely analog little switch on the incendiary 
that was just a flag that was up and the dog would theoretically go blow up the tank because the mechanical switch would hit the chassis of the tank when the dog went under it. I think they killed a couple tanks this way, but they also had to worry about the dogs trying to retreat, you know, bringing the bomb back home so they'd have to shoot both the Russians and the Germans would shoot any dogs that would be on the battlefield and headed their way. Because the dogs don't know that they're bombs, they just want to go to their friends. And so that's the weird thing, is that wherever they're most comfortable is where that they will end up. And if you train them to be most comfortable somewhere, then that place will explode. Um, just a pure notion of neural nets and logic gates and self-structured returning purifying systems. Linear feedback shift registers are used to create pseudo-random numbers. Here's all the logic gates. Here's an XOR circuit gate constructed only using NAND gates. The not ANDs symbolic logic can convert different gate types in between each other. Here's a very simple 16-step Fibonacci-ish secret, secret, I mean a Fibonacci sequence where uh, an XOR gate of the final two bits goes back to compute the new internal. So this memory structure is kind of non-linear. It takes things that aren't connected really and causally you change them. So this Fibonacci sequence is a 16 stepper that is manipulating 11, 13, 14, and 16 together. And those just keep flowing. And then they all procedurally, four of them together, generate the next one digit. So you can get 16 different states, even though they're all zeros and ones. And it fits 16 different flickers of, of output per state. And this guy might have like 128 permutations. Might, might go for near forever before it repeats. They made some other pretty uh, effective outputters of variation. Here's one gate sequence setup. This one goes to, to like an 8-bit or a 9-bit uh, permutational space. Sometimes these guys can flatline when they just accidentally, inadvertently go strictly pure 0 or pure 1. Or maybe if they're symmetrical, a 0, 1, 0, 1 might get stuck in itself. Uh, let's see. I invented the linear feedback shift register in Max using this little widget, that's all it is. Bang the output and then set the set the new output in the storage. So every time you get banged, you pump along what you are. And you can see that this is the 11, 13, 14, and 16. All put together in an XOR. And then pump back here. So all of these examples are emulatable Here's some fun examples of max patches in case they in any way offer some clarity about what's going on If you watch these uh, node connectors it's kind of like a big interconnection and then this is the visualizer unit, the LCD system. I don't see too much recursion here. It goes down, it just goes down. Nothing too complicated. Here's an Uzi 50, controlled by an Uzi 30. So it's just a procedural, controlling the circle's rays in amplitude of this uh, arrangement. Uh, here's the logic to control the collision detection. So all this is just putting two 
pairs of xy coordinates together and checking to see a couple different ways to conclude if they're colliding or not. Check out this set of eight logics. Is this one bigger than that one? Is this one bigger than that one? And then if they're all no, then that means there's a collision. And then there's special, special cases for parallel lines. And this green guy right here is each one of these maths right here. And so the original math is the first beam of light hits this wall. And then the second math takes over, hits that wall. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. So they're all reacting instantaneously. It's a fun program because the longer down the beam of light reflection chain you are, the more erratic and uncontrollably fast you move because your reflections are being updated far more often than the broad, general, original beams. So this program up here is kind of a similar program to this one. This one was designed to manually control each zone. The program knows which one of these zones I'm in, and you can click and drag on it to fill in those areas. Notice I created the word high in a very strange polar font. So this program is more about uh, manually creating a vector graphic that's got perfect geometry, especially because these things can be done for concentric uh, memory systems. This one's called Line of Sight. Uh, it was done because a lot of early video games have a pretty fun line of sight detection algorithm and all that means is you place a ray of light any position on the board and then all things on the board have a shadow cast behind them. So this particular picture shows three different casts of light and maybe a little visual effects that obscures what's going on. But you can see that there's a light cast over here. It's permitting red shadows. There's light cast over here, emitting blue, and then the light casting for green might be a little above to the left, maybe. This program was never optimized for vector control, which would probably be the next step to making it so that you could scale up the system to be very large. It would be and it is what is behind the GL engine. Thousands and millions of uh, ray tracing procedures. This says uh, kind of a simple program. It just one by one creates a circle. And those very skinny circles are of a gradient system. This one right here. This. Uh, boxy just scrub in and then whatever colors you have chosen are interpolated into a 256 a list entry of uh, all the chroma you might want so it's just a really easy circle generator uh, I changed it so that instead of a circle it was any shape really and then did a lot of animations of expanding or contracting or wiggling shapes with this and exported those to video games. Here's an all speed pulse width modulator that goes from, you can see how many it has, it has like five or six and then it goes to seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. It gets up to here and it's got like thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, and then right in here it is flicker, flicker, flicker every single pixel. So this is a pretty fun uh, pathway. You can notice these little dots are the areas that were not drawn. Same here. It's sort of related to the ninth quest frequency when you're drawing with a limited, limited pixel density and you're not doing too much uh, overlap or blending. Then you start getting little little flickering afterlife patterns. It's pretty neat though. They often show up with a symmetrical kind of lotus onion uh, 
Van Allen belt effects. Uh, this guy is probably the best thing since the Watt Generator. This is a little program that uh, self-programs itself. It reminds me of the old uh, Atari games called Popcorn. You just turn on the delay line and then these rows of uh, delay, delay objects start revolving to the right or to the left, depending on how you've got your number set. And the whole point of the program is to slowly peter down a signal through the delays, sort of like a pachinko machine or a plinko, and if it gets down to one of these yellow sound generators, then it plays that pitch, low pitch to high pitch. So the trickle down goes through all this programming just to find out where it gets to. So it opens up this uh, operating language to a world of uh, dynamic play and uh, rewritability, which uh, I don't think many people play with, or many people realize is where uh, programming can go. This is a pretty good self-contained little fractal. It generates itself uh, exponentially in complexity. It'll start with, uh, you know, just like one um, Sanfoca. And then each Sanfoca gets Sanfoca. So it might go 2, 4, 6, 8. No, no. It probably goes like 1, 10, 100, 10,000, 1 million, 7 trillion. And all the instructional rules for it fracturing in half are here. A lot of cutting and shaping. Here's the Pythagoras fractal. It's a little more complicated and gets a little bit more out of control. Gotta have your preset condition straight. Some fractals don't really know what to do after like the seventh iteration. And they just go off screen. The eighth iteration is on a scale that you couldn't even encounter the first four iterations on because it expands so fast. But you gotta knock, get it, knock out all the fractals. So uh, I'll just leave you with these words. Step-by-step -step programming recursion limitations. Yep. With this program here, I told you that every new reflection required a new object. If you're lucky, you can just uh, recurse the entire process. So that all you have to do is click a number box to choose how many of these guys in a row were working. So instead of having to generate a new program, you just make the program smart enough to be able to call itself dynamically. That's what this guy is trying to do. Sawtooth programming. I don't know if I have too many examples of a good sawtooth program. This is just kind of like trickle down one. But oftentimes when you get procedural programs, you will design a module and then it gets down to the bottom. And then you say, well, got to go to the next page. So you just send the patch cord up to here. And then it goes, trickles down. So it's kind of like the same as writing on paper, where you get to the bottom of the page and you gotta go to the top of the next page and you can think about what your eyes are doing. There's sawtooth and all around the page. Ouroboros programming, kind of another way to say feedback-based program. Output goes back to input. Self-engulfing. Self feedback amplitude wave build. There's some fun programming designs where you can just throttle like the watts governor on the feedback and you get a, a self a self uh, fulfilling uh, visual or audio experience with with sounds that are kind of like uh, shadows or reverberations of anything that was real that you might have offered to the computer in the first place so it's a uh, probably where organic sound is is a uh, just uh, smoldering or, or composting mm, musical frequencies or score sequences. 
so uh, for uh, Norbert Weiner, a lot of his work was with the uh, noise, noise floor uh, reduction, being able to increase the signal to noise ratio, and he tried to create superstitious signal filters that knew what they're trying to find and would suss out more likely than not the stuff that was not what they're trying to find. So that kind of bias, it's kind of like the opposite of the scientist's bias. Like if you know what you're looking for, you could make a program that could look for it for you. Imagine that rolling around at the thrift store. Grounding motion, bandwidth, animation programming, showed you a little bit of that. Rather than picture programming, growth. So you could think that what you're out to create was an end result was a canvas, was uh, an addition or a print, but I think the, the thing that you're out to create is the process. The consumer gets to see this picture, but the programmer understands what this picture was created by.